curious human being, and he argues that fundamentally curiosity is a characteristic of human beings, that, that there's something to be solved here, that there's, there's information here, that this is kind of screaming out to, to, our, to our stick figure on, on the uh, island of Tombolia, that decode me, decode me, figure out what I am. So suppose then we, we unpack this piece of paper, and he saw this, but he doesn't speak English. How would he then proceed to try to extract a meaning from this? So Latif argues we could develop it into words. So how would we, first of all, argue that these aren't just meaningless, you know, scraps of paper you know, just marks. Maybe it's like a Jackson Pollock painting or something. And it's just, appears to be a bunch of gibberish. Sandra, or anyone. Anyway. I think there are like three pieces. Okay, so Sandra said that there, there's repetition. There there's a, appears to be, you know, certain things that there, there's even this like kind of concept of a space, that there should be something that's parsed here. There's separation into parts. Latif. So Latif argues maybe somebody's trying to fool you. Um, it's interesting. One of the questions I have actually in, in regards to chapter six that I handed out to is I asked you guys to Google the Voynich manuscript. And the Voynich manuscript, and that's pronounced Voynich, has been the subject of intense interest by cryptologists for you know a good hundred years or so. All the guys who were, you know, working during WW2 to crack the uh, German Enigma code would, in their free time, try to decrypt the Voynich manuscript, because it was this very strange medieval text that had this really intricate system of writing, and it had then pictures of all these sort of alien plants and weird things like this that were not at all found anywhere in Europe. But the book was a European book, so people were, were wondering, w w what the hell does this mean? Um, and the problem really wasn't solved until just about a year ago when somebody showed how you could produce almost an exact replicate of the Voynich manuscript using a random generator. And it was, you would just have like a prefix for a word like um, go, and then you, you would have then like a, a, a midfix, I, I don't know what it's called, um, GL, -E, G -L, and, then, and then like a suffix. And then you would create like a matrix of these things, and you'd shift around and just randomly start generating words. Um, and then they would appear to look like natural, intelligible words, but they actually meant nothing. So the Voynich manuscript actually contained no real meaning, but it seemed to trick everybody because it had a lot of the same patterns that human language did. There's some other interesting things that um, that's connected to kind of parsing information, but um, I don't really have uh, all the time to. Uh, go into one of these things. Speaking of W's and, and letters, there's actually something called Zipf's Law, which every kind of language or meaningful message appears to obey. And that's if, if you rank the most common letters, like I believe E and some of the vowels are the most common letters, um, they, they follow a power law distribution, which means that the second most common letter is exactly half as apparent as the first one, and then so on. And it follows this very strict mathematical relationship. And they've even run this, these, these kind of power law detections on DNA and extracted that it appears to follow the same behavior as our natural languages do. Um, and, and if you feel like Googling that, that's Zipf's law, Z-I-P-F. Um, but you know, th there's a lot of things going on here. And I want to return to the question, well, what does snow is white mean? Um, and in breaking down that question, what is what does snow mean? When I say snow, what do you think? I think of snow. You think of snow, okay, but what does that mean? Let's avoid circularity. You think of a picture of snow? Okay, so Latif thinks of a picture of snow. You know. He what happens to him? To Latif is a visual image is prompted in his head, somewhere in, in kind of his, his, his tangled brain here, um, 
the visual section of his brain is activated, and he has a visual memory of, of snow. Or the first time that we had a large snow or a blizzard, and the first time you ever saw snow. Um, what about anybody else? What, what, what does snow mean to you? So then we've got kind of a, in some ways, a tactile sense of just of being of cold. So then another part of the chief's brain here lights up when you say snow. And it goes to all the times you've ever felt cold, maybe just sitting in this room and having the air conditioning up a couple notches too high. Um, you, you, you have a feeling like, geez, it's freezing in here. Right? And freezing then triggers the idea of frozen water, which triggers the idea of snow. Um, but what else? What does snow mean to you? Some of you might see it as, oh, well, this is an opportunity to go you know, snowboarding or something, right? Sorry, here's my bad recreation of bindings. Um, or go skiing or something, or it's recreation, it's time, it's winter, it's, you know, it's a break from school. There's, there's a whole really complex conceptual network in everyone's brain with, with the word snow. Just like if I were to pick apple, and I ask people, when I say apple, completely out of context, what is the first thing you think of? Apple pie, okay. Anyone else? Orchards. Anyone else? Red. Adam and Eve. I'm glad someone said it because I, was, I thought I was going to have to. So what, what then do you, do you associate with the apple and the Adam and Eve? <laughs> Say it. OK, so then we've got, wow, <laughs> holy mackerel. We've already gone from apple to God pretty damn quickly. Um, maybe I should draw that off of Adam and Eve um, if we want to make it seem like that was the, the track we fell. Um, but then what, what, was, what was it that Adam and Eve were being punished for, for eating the apple? What was it, the tree of? Knowledge. How did Newton discover gravity? What computer am I using? <laughs> A Mac. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Or your iPod, or, or whatever. Um, so immediately, if, if, if somehow I could look at your brain and, and kind of take an ongoing you know, PET scan of, of what's, being, what's lighting up as I say the word apple, it would be this extremely complicated explosion of, of electrical activity in your brain that lights up and tickles every part of the section of your brain that relates to the term apple, right? Now, of course, then when, I, when I have a frame of message, like, uh, this apple is tasty, right? Th then you immediately narrow down, well, what, what is he talking about? Is he eating about just a fresh apple, a red apple, a Granny Smith apple? Um, maybe he's talking about eating apple pie. So you, you, you prune kind of your, your ongoing neural net and you, you stick to this side. So I've noticed that nobody's come and claimed their dollar or two. Um, and this is, I think, a convenient point to uh, pull out a dialogue we did a long time ago. Uh, does anyone remember the Contra Costa Punctus? And you know, just as an apple has multiple meanings, this dialogue, page 75, has a variety of me 